Hello everybody, this is the very first uh, practicum video for uh, computational archaeology, spring 2022. And we're going to get started with uh, the very beginning of our first section of uh, the sort of practical part of the course. And this is the section that I've labeled here in Canvas, Introduction to GIS and cartography and the first report thematic mapping. So if you're in Canvas, go ahead and click that. Report one, thematic mapping. And you can preview the sort of project file here, but it's probably easier just to click that direct link. It should open it up for you in uh, Google Docs. And if you're looking at this, you can then copy your, uh, you know, your very own, make your own very cop, uh, ugh, make your own very own copy of this project uh, guide by simply going to make a copy and it will bring it over to your Google Drive and you can get it that way whenever you want. So I do encourage you to sort of read through this at the beginning. We're going to go through this over the next few weeks, you know, sort of stage by stage. And today we're just really going to do the basics. We're going to be using QGIS for this entire first project. So I'm going to show you how to download it uh, and get it installed on your computer. And then I'm going to give you a brief basic overview of how to use it. And we're going to download the sample data and open it up in QGIS. And really your task for this week is simply to get QGIS running on your computer and to download the sample data and then to try and just explore around in QGIS until you get a little bit familiar with it. So go ahead and click on this link right here at the top of the page. It will take you to the QGIS website, uh, QGIS.org. And you'll see here that uh, recently they've released a new uh, version of QGIS 3.22. Uh, they release uh, new versions quite frequently, a couple times a year actually. And so they do have a long-term support version, but typically not ton changes between the, the what we call the dot version. So any QJS 3 point whatever will be relatively familiar in terms of the layout, etc. They may have updated things behind the scenes. They may have added a few new tools, but it won't be unfamiliar. When they go to a new uh, bigger number, like four point whatever, that's when you can expect there to be pretty major changes. So anyway, 3.22 is what we got going on now. So we're going to use that this semester. Click on the download now button. It will take you to the page. It should automatically detect which operating system you are using. I am currently on Linux. This is my home laptop because you know we're we're quarantined still. I know two years later, but we are. Um, if you have a Windows machine, you, you should be seeing this, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you should just follow the express install instructions and it should automatically uh, download the, the right version 3.22 QGIS standalone installer. Click on that, follow the instructions, should be pretty straightforward. There's a variety of ways to install it. Um, honestly, this one right here is the one for you. Uh, for almost all Windows users, you should just click on this one and uh, follow the instructions. Fairly, you know, fairly straightforward installation instructions. For uh, for Mac, it's pretty much the same deal. Just use this installer, follow the instructions, and just note this thing right here where it's not yet notarized by, you know, by the App Store. So the first launch, you're going to have to right click on the icon and hold down the Option key and choose Open, just to say, yeah, I know, I downloaded software from the internet, but you can trust this website. You can tell it's the right website by going up here and just clicking on this thing and making sure that your connection is secure and it's QGIS.org. So you shouldn't worry about that too much. Um, nobody in the class is using Linux, but uh, the process is a little bit more complicated for Linux. If you're a Linux user, you should be able to figure it out by clicking on whichever version and following the instructions. Um, so once you do that, Somewhere on your computer, you will have installed QGIS. On my computer, I can get to it uh, from my applications menu item up here. And I'm just, you know, this is, again, this is Linux that I'm using. So it will look different on your computer. 
and you'll look for an icon or an app in your start menu or in your applications folder that says something like QGIS desktop. And you click on it and it should see this little splash screen 3.22 and it will open up for you. Now, I've used QGIS for years, so I have all kinds of stuff in uh, you know, this special little log files. So QGIS, even though this is a new version, knows I've got all these other QGIS projects I've done in the past. And so it's showing me my recent projects. You may not see that. You may just see the news or you may just see a welcome page over here. Um, if you've used uh, Esri software before, like ArcGIS, I think you'll immediately see or something that's relatively familiar, you know, the icons and stuff will look a little different and, you know, the menu items may be a little different, but it should look pretty familiar to you. We've got this sort of right side here, which will become our map canvas when we load our project. We've got the left side over here, which shows us some information. We've got a layers dialog. We've got a file browser. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have a bunch of icons up here, which are tools. <clears throat> I may have more than you have because I do have some plugins installed, but you might see two to three rows of uh, tools. <clears throat> and then you'll see a uh, file, regular file menu type things at the top, project edit layer, you know, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how do we get started doing anything in QGIS? Well, the simple answer is that you need some data. And I will show you how to download data, regular data files, uh, initial data files from various repositories on the web. But uh, for now, to make things a little easier in the project, uh, first project, I've given you basically a sample data set that you're gonna use for the project, <clears throat> you know, for doing some digital uh, digitization and map making and you can just click on it in, uh, you know, back in the Google Doc. And when you click on it, it's going to take you to a page uh, in, in typical Google fashion that says uh, either it's going to show you what it is or it's going to show you, uh, going to say, like, you know, I can't uh, preview this because it hasn't been scanned for viruses or something. But you should be able to... Um, uh, write click on it and uh, save link as and uh, whoops let me pause and try that again uh, I changed the project file and now it's actually doing something different ah there is the button download ah. and it's gonna say right now it's gonna say can't scan this file for viruses download anyway you're going to click on that and it's going to download the zip archive for you i did this earlier so you didn't have to watch you know the the numbers count down as the thing tried to download it's only 30 something megabytes so uh here's the deal it will look like this 34.1 megabytes it's in my downloads folder and uh what i want to do is uh, uh at this particular point I want you to create a folder somewhere else uh, m on my operating system the base you know user folder is called home but it might be your C drive or it might be your user folder depending on what operating system it is and I want you to call that project um, or that folder GIS projects now I did this earlier you know it's empty but you can see you can basically do it however it works for your operating system for me it's home new folder and then i named it uh, gis projects so i want you to take that zip folder that you uh zip archive that you downloaded and i want you to uh, move it to that new folder called gis projects and then go back to wherever your GIS projects folder is. And you'll see you have this zip archive. Now this has to be unzipped. Uh, if you're on Windows, uh, you might need a little free program, WinZip or something like that, or maybe it's built into it by now. On Mac, it should be built into it, or you might need a little app. But for me, all I have to do is right click on it and go extract here. 
and whatever was inside the zip archive comes out into the, the folder with the same name. At this point, you could delete the zip file. You don't need it anymore, but might as well hang on to it in case things go wrong. You can just start from new, delete what you did before, and you'll get back to, to square one. Always useful when you're starting something new. And inside this, you have the SPV, which stands for San Pasquale Valley Survey Folder. This is a GIS project folder and I will have shown you at this point my system for organizing my GIS files and so that's why we have GIS projects you can have any number of projects in here which should have their own folders and then within the folder you'll have the actual data directory separated by rasters and vectors just to keep things straight in your head you'll have your project file which is uh, in 3.22 a QGZ file Previous versions of QGIS might have QGS files that can be opened uh, by recent versions. So whether it says QGZ or QGAS for older versions, don't worry about it. This is a file that's saved by QGIS to simply save the state of your project uh, at any particular point. So we're going to use this, uh, but briefly, the raster, you open it, there's only one raster, there's your base map, which are ortho photos, satellite photos, uh, and then the vectors, there's several different vectors. I'll talk about file formats in a little bit. But at this particular point, this particular QGZ file is the one that we're interested in to get us started in QGIS. Uh, you can open it multiple ways. Actually, you could probably double click on this and your operating system should know to open it with QGIS. But let's just open it the traditional way. Uh, we can use our file browser window here, or we can go to project open. And uh, we can navigate to our home GIS projects, SPV survey, and then SPV survey.qgz file. And then we can click on that to open it up. And it may say that there are a few things that are unavailable but let's continue with that depends on a couple different things okay so I'm just gonna remove this top layer we're just looking at the ortho photo base map right this is a satellite imagery you can uh, use the scroll well to zoom in if you want. This is the first thing I, I suggest you do. You can see it's actually quite detailed. This uh, imagery is, um, if I'm recalling correctly, something like 25 centimeters or 30 centimeter uh, spatial resolution. Um, and this is the project area. You can zoom out again. I'm just using the scroll wheel on my trackpad here uh, just to zoom in and out on the areas. Uh, you can use these zoom tools if you want to zoom more precisely. You can draw a little box and it will try to fit that, whatever was inside that box, it'll try and fit it to the screen. And if you want to use the zoom out tool, it's kind of a, the opposite of that. It's sort of a scalar to zoom out in the ratio, you know, between the size of the box you drew and the actual size of the screen you're looking at. Um, and if you click this one over here, zoom full, it will zoom to the full extent of the, the base map. And it may take a little while depending on the, the um, strength of your computer because the map actually extends pretty far up to the north. Um, so that's the base map. Uh, the project file is uh, a good thing thing to load because it automatically creates a project and in the browser over here you'll see something called project home and what that does is it sends you to the folder that the project file lives in and if you use my system for setting up all of your data files in the folder uh, that you know and that is in the same folder as the, the project file the .qgz files and they're below it in these folders called raster and vector then project home over here when you click on the little arrow is going to automatically have all your data files right there 
you can technically have your data files anywhere you want on your computer. They can be spread all over the place. They can all be in different folders and different parts of your computer. But the problem with doing that is if you move anything, your project is going to break and it's going to say, can't find any of the, the stuff, right? So here we have our same folders under the raster. It's the same base map that's already loaded by default. Under the vector, we have uh, three vector files. We have this little folder that says 2017 structures outlines. We have this icon that says structures lines .gpkg. That stands for geo package and survey grid .gpkg. Again, starting for geo package. And if you click on the little arrow, you'll see that the geo packages actually have some stuff underneath them, uh, including the grid, right? So, we can load these in in multiple ways. You can drag them down. You can right click on them and uh, add them to it. Uh, or you can double click on them and they should load up. But here's the survey grid. And this is the grid you're going to use. You're going to pick one of these squares to do your survey in. And when you initially add it to QGIS, it comes in as a set of polygons, of square polygons. So let me zoom in uh, over here. I can use my zoom tool again to do that. And you can see that it is now blocking the, our view of the base map because in the layer manager, it is located above this uh, base map. So if I click on this and drag it down, I could put it below, and so now the base map is uh, visible and the survey grid is invisible, or at least it's below. So that's your first clue of how to use the layer dialog over here. Anything that's up above on the layer, uh, in the layer list, is going to be visible on top in the map uh, window. It's not to say that it is physically on top in the real world, it's just visible more or less visible, you know, above or below. Uh, you can also make things invisible by clicking the little checkbox here. So when it's unchecked, the layer just, you just can't see it. It's still there, you just can't see it. Same thing you could do with the base map, right? And now it's a blank map canvas on that side. Um, in this case, because this is a set of polygons or areas, they're colored in and the outlines are colored in one color and the areas are actually in this case colored in uh, some sort of goldenrod. It may be different when you load it up. To change that, you can right click on this uh, layer that says survey grid and go to properties. And the properties dialog is where we can do a lot of stuff. Firstly, it tells me something about it in the info tab. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other tabs over here, but the one that we're really going to look at most initially is this one that says Control Feature Symbology. And you click on it, and you can see that lovely uh, goldenrod color. Now you'll see it says Fill, and then it says Simple Fill. When we're, it, it's kind of a hard thing to understand, but the fill, the fill is actually all of the styling, including the, the, the lines. And so if we changed the opacity here, if we wanted to make it more transparent, we would change the whole thing to be transparent. So if I roll this down and I just click OK, you can see the whole thing becomes a little bit transparent, including the lines. Now that might be OK for you, but what if we wanted to make the polygons fully transparent but keep the lines fully opaque? We can do that. We're gonna, you can go back to right click and properties, or actually you can double click and it will open the same thing. So I'm gonna set the opacity back to 100% and hit apply and just show you, uh, whoops, uh, just show you that it's back to the way it was. Um, but if we click from fill to simple fill, now we're, we can separate out the lines, which is this thing that says stroke color and the fill color over here. And when we click on the fill color, we can actually now go down and set the opacity all the way to zero. Click OK, click OK again, and now you can see the lines are there, and the color is now completely transparent for the faces of these square areas. 
and we can style the survey grid lines also. So I'm going to go back into the properties, fill, click on simple fill. And here we have stroke color. Now I could change that to anything I wanted. Uh, I could change it to bright red if I wanted to. And I can change it from a solid line to, let's say, a dotted line. And I could make it just a little bit thicker by changing the stroke width to 46 millimeters and click OK. And now we have dotted red lines. And if I zoom in to a, an area like that, we can actually see them. Now the dots are really close together, so maybe we want to do something like, um, uh, instead of dotted lines, maybe we want to go dashed lines and click OK. And it should have, I guess you would have to look a little bit closer, but they are dashed in this particular case. Um, so we'll zoom back out. Uh, okay. You can see the dashes kind of building over here. Um, now, that's great. We have our survey grid. And we have our base map. What I want you to do at this particular moment, you can use the zoom tools. Uh, you can use this little panning tool. So let me zoom in again to a, to a grid, and I'll show you what that panning tool does. Um, click on it. It's the little white glove or hand. And click down and hold it and move the mouse, and you can just move the background image around with you a little bit. And that's useful for when you're doing your survey. Uh, you can zoom in and uh, you know just move the map around while you're looking at it. And of course you can zoom in still with the scroll wheel in and out. It's a little bit, uh, it might go a little faster than you might want. So if you want some precision, again, use those zoom tools over here. Um, and you can basically start to look at the imagery and start to try and see what you can see. So <clears throat> those are the main and uh, simplest uh, tools that you're going to use uh, just initially. You're going to explore uh, how to add um, you know, existing data. So here we have our geo package for our structure lines. And this one over here is a shapefile of the exact same thing. And I wanted to show you uh, two different ways of containerizing vector data. The same exact data, but two different vector containers. Shapefile is an older format, an Esri proprietary format, been around for a very long time. And it's sort of like, the lowest common denominator. It's backwards compatible, but it's also very limited uh, in terms of the kind of data uh, that it can represent, the topology that it can represent, the number of characters in the database that it can have when you type text into it, uh, and, and a bunch of other stuff, right? And also, if I go back, um, oops, if I go back to our fi regular file browser and I go to vector, and I, the reason why I have this 2017 structures outlines in its own folder, as you can see, how many ancillary files have to be kept together. Nominally, this .shp is the shapefile, but if it doesn't have the .shx, if it doesn't have the .prj, and at least the .dbf in the same folder with it, you won't be able to load the data in because. This is an older format. This is the table of data. This is the projection information. This is some metadata. This is the topology. And then these are other kinds of uh, ancillary files that you may or may not have, depending on what kind of shape file, how old it is, etc. But if any of these things get moved outside of this folder, if you change the name of one of them but not the other ones, it's not going to be able to load the data into your GIS, no matter what software you're using. And so you have to make a folder and keep all that stuff together. That's the best practice. Geo packages, on the other hand, should be more independent if you want them to be. And they're also more modern. And they're not just limited to vector data. If you go to raster, you'll notice that the orthophoto base map is also a geo package. And you'll note that it's pretty small for this high resolution of data. It's only 35.6 megabytes. 
But the original GeoTIFF that I created this from was actually on the order of 805 some odd megabytes. So they actually compress the data and they make it very, very, very uh, much smaller than it might be with the older, more raw type uh, data sets like Shapefile and GeoTIFF. So that's why we're using them in this particular project uh, at this particular point. So I put the shapefile there just to, for you to compare it, but really let's add in the structures lines uh, dot j gpkg geo package. You can see I clicked on it, double clicked, and it added it right here. And so if I scroll out a little bit, you can see these are the, the lines over here. Uh, now all of these things, I'll zoom in on one area with my zoom tool. All of these are uh, the actual data we collected while in the field. Some of this was collected with hyper GPS. Some of it was digitized by me on the same imagery. But these are different heritage properties owned by different families. And we have uh, essentially outlined various kinds of structures. And you may be able to see some of them on the imagery. Uh, but you may not be able to see all of them. So you'll see lines here, then you'll be like, what were they looking at? Well, those are terrace walls or aqueducts that are only below the, the canopy of the orchards. But you can certainly see the outline of some of the buildings, right? Some of them are buildings that are still in use, and some of them are actually ruins from uh, 100 or more years ago. And again, if you turn it on and off, you can kind of get a sense of what these things are, these outlines are about. Um, so initially when it's loaded in, the lines are thin and they're all kind of brown. I'm going to show you how to do thematic mapping later, but we'll just double click on this and we'll go to line and we'll click on simple line where we actually get some, um, you know, uh, things we can change. I'm going to change the color to something a little bit more visible for my eye. I'm going to make it sort of a yellowy color. You can choose whatever color you want. I'm going to make it thicker. And I'm going to click OK. And now all of a sudden I can see a little bit better <laughs> my lines. Now, there are a few more nuances I want to tell you about before we're done. Uh, but basically, this is it for now. Um, you know, just zoom around, change the color of things, use the pan tool for now. If you're feeling adventurous, you can use this uh, identify features tool and you can click on some lines and it may tell you some stuff. You know, I'll talk about the table and actual queries uh, maybe in the next video, but this tells you, you can actually look over here and see my codes, T-Wall and Terrace Wall. And if you go to the uh, report project one, you know, overview, you will actually see the codes that we're going to use down here. And you can see how they're actually encoded in the existing data set as well. So that's basically it for now. What I, last thing I'll show you is that if you want these colors, you know, that you've changed everything and the and you know, if you zoomed in just right, if you want all of this to come back next time you open the project file, you need to save the project file. And that's simply done under project save. And at this point, I can close this, reopen that QGZ file, and I will be uh, looking exactly at the same view. Uh, I can save multiple versions of the QGZ file. So if I like this view and I want to save it for a future reference, I can go um, project save as and give it a special name. And then anything I do after that, if I save it back to the original one, will not be reflected. I can have like a, a, a fresh starting point if I want to by saving as a separate file and keeping it somewhere and not m messing with it. Um, so that's good if, if you, especially when you're experimenting and you mess things up and you're like, wow, I really don't like the way any of this looks. Let me go back to the original way that I had it and I was happy with it. 
You can have as many QGZ files as you want. If you have too many, you might start getting confused. So maybe not more than a couple to start with and give them meaningful names. Like, uh, you know, right now I just called this SPV survey, but if I wanted to save as, so I know what this little, you know, this particular one is, I can put red grid, yellow features, right? And I can hit save. And if I go back to my just regular file browser, you can see there's the, my original survey QGZ and here's the one I saved as with the little description to help me remember whatever it was that I saved this particular version as. And eventually we're gonna digitize and we're gonna add data um, to some of these files. And it's important to knowing that saving the project is not the same thing as saving new data. You can certainly remove um, you know, things that are in the layer tree and have them be invisible. Um, and when you save your project file, they won't be there in the layer tree, but you're not really deleting the data and you're not, if you've digitized something, just saving the project file is not gonna save any new data. It's just saving literally the view and the style, the zoom level, the colors, you know, the thickness of the lines. That's all that the QGIS uh, project file is saving. What files, actual data containers are loaded in the layer tree and how you styled them and how you've zoomed into them. And that's it. So that's all for this week. Uh, that should be plenty to get you going. Um, you can definitely feel free to explore some of this other stuff if you're an advanced user. If you're a newbie, then probably this is going to be plenty for you to deal with for the time being. We'll see you all next week.